Hello. Hi. Hi. Here we are. It's so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, my camera. I don't know. Maybe I kicked it or something, but I'm a little off center. I guess that's good. How are you today? I'm fine, but my head is full of Harvey Weinstein and his transgressions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry to make you have to think about that while we're yes. doing this. So uh, we have a full uh, and filling chat. So please chat folks. It's just me here today. So if you have um, a question, put it in there, put under capital like question or comment that you'd like uh, feedback on. We're switching um, topics now. And um, so as I said earlier, just uh, you know, the jury case against Harvey Weinstein heads into deliberations now. Uh, and we hope for some semblance of justice for his victims, both the ones who came out to testify and the many, many victims that he has uh, that did not or were, were unable to. But we know that for the women he hurt, some of whom were children at the time, healing is going to be a much longer journey. Harriet Fraud is back on the show to talk about the long term implications of the kind of child abuse these women endured and how it might have muddied the waters in terms of their relating to uh, a predator like Weinstein. Uh, many people have said that, you know, there's a, there's a certain expectation that if you are raped or if you're, uh, you know, predated upon, you would just say, oh, that's terrible, and then run, a run away and leave. Uh, but that's not necessarily, it's not so cut and dry, especially when like some of the women who have testified, you have been sexually abused or abused you know, a as a child. Harriet Fraud is a mental health counselor and hypnotherapist in practice in New York City, a founding member of Second Wave Feminism. Harriet specializes in speaking and writing about topics in which psychology and economics overlap. She is the host of the podcast called Capitalism Hits Home. It is on the network with Professor Wolf, the Democracy at Work Network. Dr. Fraud, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. So you've been following this Weinstein case and the Epstein case and all the Steens who are questionable. Um, I'm going to ask you to just back up from your camera a little bit so we can have a full view of your whole head because you're a little bit cut off about at the this <laughs> oh maybe a little bit more if you could sit back just a little bit more that'd be terrific okay. there you go that's better we want to see your whole um presence here oh that's perfect whole presence with us that's beautiful very good and the lighting is good that way too harry can you say a few words yes I oh, okay great can. great so what are, uh, you know, a former model has accused Weinstein of forcing her to massage his genitals when she was 16 after she refused to have sex with him. Um, uh, one of the women is being based, I'm not sure if it's the same one, I sometimes I lose, I lose it, uh, lose the through line of all the women who've been abused, but one of the women is being basically dragged through the mud by you know uh, Weinstein's lawyers and the media for having both accused him of um, abuse and also having had a relationship with him. Can you talk about, and this is the one who said that she had been uh, abused in her childhood. Can you talk about maybe what, how can we understand what this woman is going through psychologically? What are the ramifications of having been abused on your current, relationships? Well, most children who are sexually abused are abused by the adults in, in whom their care is entrusted. So the whole society, whether it's a father or an uncle, tells you that these are the people who know what's, or a priest or whatever, what's best for you. These are the people who are to look out for you. And so when you're abused, if, if you haven't ever been educated about what abuse is what's good touching and bad touching when you're little, you assume that this is part of the intimate relationship at the same time as you feel the tension going on because a predator in order to abuse a child has to be in a dissociated state, kind of abstracted as they act out a sick fantasy. And 
the child picks up those weird vibes, but doesn't have a language in which to express this and is told by the whole society that adults know better, adults do what's good for you. You don't have a voice within the hierarchy of dominance and subordination between children and adults. And so when a trusted adult takes sexual advantage of you, you become very confused. And also your guard is let down. You lose the kind of vigilance that an educated child taught about good touching and bad touching and able to report bad touching or bad proximity in their personal space and be heard and protected has a, is armed against sexual predators. But one where the lines are confused, confuses the lines her or himself. And that seems to have happened to one of the women who was both raped, but also looked to him as a father figure, mm. reminiscent of her abuse as a child. And so that their lines of self and other, their sense of self-protection, their sense of the inadmissibility or admissibility of sexual predation is confused. And they blame themselves because the child is supposed to be good and obey, which means shutting up and obeying the adult. It okay. doesn't mean questioning the adult's motive or going to someone else and saying, is this okay? Because children are trained to obey. And so you get a very, <clears throat> excuse me, confused person who is confused about what's permissible, what isn't, where the boundaries of her own body can be protected and where they can't, and who's in charge. Mm. And that's what happened to that young woman. At the trial, Weinstein has paid, highly paid an army of lawyers to defend him. Female because, lawyers, I noticed, which yes, I thought was particularly was, upsetting. You can usually pay a woman to betray other women. Oh. He has both the lawyer Rotano and also Elizabeth Loftus, who became Loftus became famous for testifying against women who said they were sexually abused in childhood and saying that unscrupulous hypnotists put these memories in their minds and that they didn't exist. Oh Freud. yeah, we've heard that. That's that's the story that's gone around the world. Well, that was Freud's premise after saying, no, these hysterical girls were abused. His colleague Fleece convinced him, no, it was their fantasy life. And Fleece later was exposed as a sexual abuser of his own children. As it and turns that, out, course, wouldn't you yes, imagine Yes, as that? it turns out. <laughs> and of course, the burghers of Austria we're rather pleased that it wasn't they who did it. It was a kid's fantasy that was at fault. In fact, in the early psychoanalytic circles, the second to Freud was a Hungarian called Sandor Ferenczi, who said, no, Sigmund, that's not true. And for that, he was ostracized and pushed out, even though he was revered before contradicting this theory. So what you let me, have- Let me break in here just briefly sure. for a quick aside. Why do you think Sigmund Freud, father of psych psychiatry or whatever, psychology, couldn't, couldn't take in the fact that there are so many women reporting sexual abuse? Well, I mm -hmm. think that he, like many men today, even though he lived in the 1800s and first published in 1860, did not trust women's words. He felt that women, oh. although he was more respectful of women than most, and there were many women in his psychoanalytic institute, like Sabina Spielrein and Lou Andrea Salome, who, because women were particularly interested in this field, it was one of the few medical fields that welcomed women. He didn't really feel that either children 
or women's words were to be believed. So that was one reason. The other thing is the burghers of Germany and Austria weren't so enthusiastic about learning that they, many of their number abused their children. Later, when I was an intern, I remember reading the book, A Victorian Gentleman, about how they all raped children. And that oh, that was the sexual proclivity they enjoyed. And I remember asking at a seminar that I was in on my job, well, wait a minute, if you read Victorian Gentlemen, that seems to corroborate those women's stories. They found that interesting. Okay. <laughs> interesting, but not something they had thought of before. How interesting is that? Right. Yes, right. and so that, that there's that tradition. And someone like um, we Weinstein's lawyer, Elizabeth Rotano, when they ask you, has anything ever happened to you? said no, because I don't put myself in that position. In other words, women are to blame for putting themselves in that position. It isn't rape that's a crime, it's your outfit. Yeah, it's, it's, your it's being born to this particular family that has a rapist in it. <laughs> exactly. That's your crime, you should have figured that out when you were a zygote and just jumped out exactly. of there. Exactly, <laughs> and you should have somehow known what you, you couldn't have learned from your childhood. So that hashtag, that believe women hashtag really goes right to the root of uh, sexual abuse. That's right. Nasser, who was the Olympic um, gymnast doctor, abused 265 Sorry. women. Fuck. Sorry. They were not believed. He, he continued for 21 years. Bill Cosby, his particular sex routine of drugging the women and sexually abusing them, even though he would have gotten a lot of willing women who had a sense of will, it was important to him to rob them of that. Or Weinstein, who set up situations where he could abuse women and was turned on by their saying no, didn't, you know, they could proceed for so many years because women were not believed and also were shamed the way Elizabeth Rotunno, Weinstein's lawyer, tried to make the crime, the dress you wore, the situation you were in. Women drinking is not a crime. Men raping women who drink is a crime, but there's a shift of the apologists for rapists. And that's what she tried to accomplish with that statement. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't put herself in that position. It's the woman the crime is a woman being in that position. It's, it's the funny. It's a very old way of thinking. I mean, it I have, sure was. you know, my family itself is from a very small provincial area of Italy and my older relatives really still have that. Even the women have this internalized. Well, at the same time, they tell their daughters like, stay away from this one. He's dangerous. Don't go over there, blah, blah, blah. They try to protect them from predation they still have the same is it a religiosity that says oh it was the woman's fault or, i don't understand where that even why that would even well it's right there in in uh, genesis oh it's eve's fault it isn't like god said look if you bite the apple these are the consequences so bear that in mind no he just said don't do it with a patriarchal authority she tried it so did adam but she's blamed and she, you know, God says in sorrow shall thou, shall thee bring forth children and your husband will dominate you, will rule over thee as if it's her punishment for being curious that created the evil in the world. Wow. This is kind of blowing my mind, Harriet. Yeah, well, I mean, I know about Adam and Eve, but when you put it together like that, it's like, yeah, yep. Yeah, well, Christianity replaced the matriarchal religions that worshiped women's sexuality as the genesis of children. Mm -hmm. And they replaced it by making women the source of evil. Mm -hmm. And in Catholicism, the only good woman is the Virgin Mary, who happens to reproduce without having any joy or sex. Wow. <laughs> yes. That's quite a trick. So it robs women of their sexuality 
while it makes them producers of men's children. And, you know, I, I remember passing St. Patrick's Cathedral one day and there was a gay protest outside because gayness was forbidden. And these guys had themselves raped, you know, just draped with condom outfits. And they were singing, glory to the newborn king. Mary never felt a thing. <laughs> Which captured it so beautifully. I love it. <laughs> um, so back to the Weinstein case. Um, it seems like this, I really had some, a lot of sympathy for this woman who was Me being dragged too. through the mud on New York one. You know, if you're not right. in New York, it's the major local news source. Um, very popular. It gets played in all the gas stations and the donut shops and the TVs and you get your weather and you get your news. And um, it's interesting living in New York because our local news is also the national news. So it's, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so boy there's so much i wrote down to ask you about but just with the how can we i i just wanted to put out there like a further understanding of how we can understand this woman was abused by weinstein as she says she was but also like returned his call the next day because that's where they're saying hey she liked it or she wanted it or just because she returns her calls and therefore she should be okay with rape she was very confused. She was raped as a child and she was very confused about rapists because she was taught to trust her family and there were some nice things that were done in her family by these same people. I had a little five-year-old client when I lived in New Haven and she had been raped by her stepfather. God damn. And when she Sorry. was four. Ah. But he was the only person who was nice to her in the family. Her parents were divorced. She didn't see her own father much. He married someone with her own children, with her own children. And this man paid attention to her and groomed her. And he took her on trips and he was the only one who loved her. So her feelings were so confused. I mean, she came to me because she was acting out. She was stripping herself naked in the bathroom and, and swallowing water and spitting it at other children because she was very confused because he was kind to her and protective of her. And he was the only one in the family. So <clears throat> for someone who has been raped by a trusted adult mm -hmm. who is kind to her, the situation is very confusing mm -hmm. and she doesn't learn to protect herself. Seeing a predator where someone who promises to protect her and give her opportunities, which Harvey did with all of the people he raped, promised them opportunities in Hollywood and in the films. So that if she had been groomed that way as a child, it would be very confusing. Did they, did Harvey Weinstein's um, accusers bring, lawyers bring out a psychiatrist or psychologist to explain this dynamic to the jury? Yes, but Good. whether they got it, and you don't know, one of the things that Weinstein's lawyers did is they are allowed to dismiss potential jurors for, for no reason stated. They dismissed every female they could get away with. So the jury was weighted towards men, uh. seven men, five women, when it's usually much more mixed. And um, they hope, Weinstein hopes, to appeal to the predator in men who are afraid of being accused. And some people who aren't predators are afraid of being accused. And they'll have to actually listen for signals and watch women instead of just proceeding. God forbid that you have to be <laughs> That you sensitive. get treated like a person instead of a thing. How interesting. That's right. And where you have to ask, is this okay with you? I'd like to do this. How do you feel about it? So you get consent. A moment of awkwardness for them who aren't used to it. Much better than being raped. 
You talked a little bit about the um, the the long term damage of childhood sexual abuse. Weinstein's been accused of abusing at least one teenager. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what the other long term damage is, and hopefully the the hope uh, about around getting treatment and uh, you know living a better life? Well, yeah, one uh, of the things surviving. is that you see all sex as rape, mm -hmm. and you either become promiscuous is thinking that's all you have to offer because that's what you offered a person in the family who paid attention to you. So that's how you get attention. I remember having a client who was in college and she was acting very seductive and tried to kiss me on the way out of a session. Wow. And I said, don't worry. I won't respond to you and I won't let you do this. I'm here to listen to you and to help you. She was embarrassed then later, but she wanted me to like her. And that's what she had thought she had to offer in her family. And so that their sexuality is very confused. They're either promiscuous because they think that's all they have to offer, even if they may not feel anything, or they're totally resistant of sex. And if the person is someone who they trusted in their family, they can only have sex with strangers and not with their with a husband mm -hmm. or somebody who's emotionally close. Mm -hmm. It's a damage for their whole life. Wow. Their trust has been violated and their sexuality has been perverted. We have some questions coming in from the chat room. Um, <clears throat> one question is, uh, can Dr. Fraud explain what, what you believe the best way for society is to handle child sex offenders? Your opinion on maybe uh, virtuous pedophile groups? I don't know what that is, and just the name <laughs> makes me feel sick. Uh, where people with the same attraction encourage each other to not offend, um, you know, and then the question goes on to ask about state-sponsored psychiatry programs and their similarity to gay conversion therapy. So this is a lot of questions all in one, but I'll just toss it over to you and you can, you can, and that is from our friend Toilet Lurker, who is a regular uh, participant in our stream. So bad name. <laughs> I'm sure they're not lurking in a toilet, but anyway. Um, At any rate, you know, these are good questions. Sex Abuse Anonymous is a very powerful group and people get help in curbing their sexual perversions that involve imposing themselves on other people. Wow. Sex Abuse Anonymous has both victims and perpetrators, but, and I think that that on a short-term basis, that that's useful. On a long-term basis, what you have to do is bring boys up differently. So the only need they're allowed to have, particularly as they enter puberty, is a sexual need. And where girls are disparaged by coaches, what's the matter, you're acting like a girl? What's the matter, you got your period? which coaches say when boys aren't willing to run out there and knock into other people, mm -hmm. but, or push themselves, that you need to have permission for boys to be frightened, for boys to be gentle, for boys to need to be hugged, for boys to need approval other than sexual approval. So you take the weight of, a, of emotional, acceptance away from sex and distribute it onto a whole range of emotions. One of the reasons that women aren't doing that so much is that we're allowed to have more needs than sexual needs. In fact, our sexual needs are more repressed. But you'd need to change child rearing and team sports. You'd need to have encourage boys to play with dolls and jacks and jump ropes and not have, you know, rock 'em sock 'em robots and guns as children's toys. I find so, that uh, the <laughs> my daughter is doing something that I was doing, which is like, oh, all the things that are supposed to be fun are boy thing, boy things. So let me just boy out my, right. you know, 
And, you know, she is really attracted to like dolls and nurturing. And, she, but like when she goes to school, everyone's doing rockets. And <laughs> I'm just like, can we also put dolls in the school, even though there's boys there? It's almost like girls are encouraged and allowed to um, do rockets and whatever. I'm just using that as a metaphor for all the kind of boy rock 'em sock 'em, as you said, things. Um, and yet, I don't necessarily see the boys encouraged to play with the dolls and take care of the stuffed animals. It's well, they aren't because <sighs> female activities have much lower prestige. So, for a girl to be a tomboy, there's a place for her. There's a place for her to want contact sports. There's a place for her to be aggressive. There's a place for her to be outspoken. There's a place for her to be in science or engineering or math or technology. But for a boy to want to be a nurse, to want to be a baby nurse, to want to nurture, to play with dolls, to dress up and play in girls' clothes, to um, talk about his feelings and his needs is discouraged because it's part of the sexism of our society mm -hmm. that limits boys, you know, that, that uh, and even well-meaning parents want to protect their little boys from the meanness and taunting they'll get if they act girlish. So that a friend of mine who has a little boy who has two older sisters and he had his nails painted because they were all painting nails and he thought that was great. And on the way out, he grabbed one of his sister's purses to take to nursery school. And that was it for his father. He said, lose the purse, hmm. you know, like, oh my God. And he did in part because he felt the kid would be mocked. When he wore sandals, he liked kids in the school, in nursery school said, those are girls shoes. And because he was their child, he said, they're my favorite shoes and you're hurting my feelings. Hmm. And they laughed at him. Oh. So he was being inculcated into a kind of toxic maleness in nursery school. Mm -hmm. You have to make a real effort as they do in other countries. They don't even use gender pronouns in Sweden in the nursery schools because they don't want to divide people. And girls and boys are encouraged. My daughter saw a book. It was like a Berenstein Bears book at the bookstore. Yeah. And it was when Brother Bear didn't had a, you know, a, a club with boys and it said, no girls allowed. And she said, mommy, what's this book? And I read it to her and then I regretted it immediately because I said, well, it's a book called No Girls Allowed. And we didn't read the book. The I love the Berenstein Bears. I feel like they have a lot of good messages. And um, she's like, why wouldn't they want any girls? We should all play together. And I was like, I don't know. They must be uh, not feeling well that day, not thinking straight. <laughs> that was my response because I'm like, yeah, of course they should want girls. Um, but it's just, it's out there. And my it daughter was is. shocked that that was a thing. You know, it was just seeing her be exposed to the world in a certain way and then trying to buffer it so that she could still maintain her sense of self-worth. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's like a it is a lot of work. Because, <laughs> you know, we're not in a society that normalizes male nurturance. There's in, if you go to Sweden, every men's room has a changing room because whereas in the United States, only women's rooms have one of those fold down tables where you can change your baby's diaper. Mm. In Sweden, every men's room has that. And you see all sorts of fathers with little children. You see their well-paid daycare people being male as well as female because there's a national funded effort. And we would need to do that. You know, I would recommend, there's a wonderful film out, it's on Netflix and it's called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood and it's about mm -hmm. Mr. Rogers, but it, it's really about how a man learns that his rage covers up fear and vulnerability. Mm 
it's a beautiful film. Mm -hmm. But there's too few of those. Uh, my and, friend, well, my friend Brad, who is uh, propaganda in the stream, said, "This is so true. I had to change the baby in the trunk this weekend." Yes. Yeah, because yeah. you walk in to a men's room and there's no changing table. Are you going to put it on the <laughs> the toilet? Yeah. Right. Although I prefer the trunk, to be honest, <laughs> even if all if it's not too freezing, because it's yeah. those tables aren't safe anyway. <laughs> it's true. No but at least they have them. We have another question. Um, it's a slightly, uh, hold on, let me get back up to it. Here it is. Um, this is another one of our, our regulars. Um, oh, let me make the, let me get to the question, Mr. Decrypting's question here. I'm scrolling through so I can find it. So give me a Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, I can't find the question, but I read it, so I may have memorized it. Um, the question was, can you talk, what were the, the sort of matriarchal, female-oriented um, religions that happened before Christianity? And could you talk a little bit about um, those and where people can get more information on them? And maybe we can all dream about what society would be like if those uh, took, took fire and, 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 and well, caught on. society that... Um, was a model actually for the Iroquois were a model for the women of Seneca Falls at their first women's conference before when they were working for the vote for Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And the Iroquois are something that everybody kind of knows about. And it, it meant that if a, a woman, women were elders as well as men, they were people who were considered wise as well as men. It wasn't that men were discriminated against, but the society respected women. And women, if they wanted to divorce a man, they just put his belongings outside of the tent so he got the picture. And, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> because- That's, That's, the, still happens these days. You just throw the stuff out the window. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> If you live in the country, you could take your tent and put it on someone's lawn, but not in New York. But uh, that was the custom. And childhood and babies were brought up by the mother and the mother's brothers. The father might be a father figure to his sister's children, but birth was matrilineal. Women were kind of in charge, and there was a sense of respect. So that's an example that we all can read about the Iroquois. In fact, there's a very good um, book that's real thin and easy to read called, I think it's called White Indians of North America. And it's about how often if women were captured or children were captured by Native Americans, they often captured people to replace children of theirs that had been killed by the settlers or women in the tribe that had been captured. People came to rescue them later and they wouldn't come back because they were treated with respect and as equals. Children were treated as future heads of the tribe, very important people, and women were equal. So they found that the great rescue operations didn't turn out the way they expected. It means a system of respect for women's generativity, our ability to give birth, which is quite a neat trick. And our- <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> yes, our contribution. And also in early societies, you had much less hierarchy. Everybody shared, you couldn't, trap an animal by yourself. If you were trapping a big animal, a whole group had to make of usually men who were hunters who left home because women were there to feed the children and also to find the edibles that were the mainstay of the tribe. And women made the clay vessels and so on. They had very important equal roles. Men's hunting sometimes bagged an animal, sometimes it didn't, but they had to do it together because it took a lot of men to drive, to dig a big hole, drive the animal into a hole with noise together, 
and then carve it up and share it. It was a sharing communal society and women's role of food provision was crucial. That changed as people developed their own livestock further away from home and <coughs> men's roles became more lucrative. <coughs> So all early societies had more matriarchy. Hmm. Let's get back to that. I, I mean, in society. <laughs> we have um, some other questions related to, to the society <coughs> in which we currently live. Bless you. Um, or gazoon type? <laughs> which one do you prefer? <laughs> we need another one, a non-, non um, oh. relate. Yeah, to your health. Well, bless, bless you was because they thought when you sneezed, your soul left your body. Yeah. And you had to get a blessing to bring it back in. Right, because that, okay, so that's science. We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> Maybe, I'm not sure. We have a question from Lauren, uh, another one of our regulars and our, one of the moderators of our chat. Um, everyone here is so beloved to me uh, in the, who's in the chat today, so I really appreciate that. Um, Lauren says, uh, I'm an abuse survivor myself, though physical and emotional, not sexual. So I survived abuse from the age of four until my mid twenties. Throughout my time growing up, my grades in school suffered. I had no friends. I struggled relating to other children and teens. The teachers always labeled me as lazy or unmotivated. If any of them had asked me about my home life, I could have been saved. How and to what degree of responsibility do educators have in identifying abuse? Huge. Huge responsibility. For example, in every school that is a daycare in France, in every school, all medical care is provided in the school. It's not up to the individual parents. And if they see signs of abuse, like a very depressed child or a child with bruises, they bring in the social worker, they look at the family, they talk to the child. So there's some kind of safety net. Had that happened to Lauren, is that her name? Lauren. They would have identified that she had trouble and she would have been able to talk to someone and a social worker would have worked with her family. But we don't have that safety net. And we should have it. We should have that in every school as they do in most, well, in the other developed nations of the world. We are very backward around children. How do we, that actually goes right to a wonderful question that I had. Um, you said earlier, children are, well, I'm saying my question is wonderful. Your comment was wonderful. And now <laughs> I have a question. Um, you say that, uh, so I think there was two areas that I wanted to touch on. One is how do we teach our children about good touching and bad touching and bad proximity in personal space? What are the words that people can use with their kids? And you know, I'm asking for personal reasons because at some point I'm going to have to have this conversation. Well, I think it's possible to say to a kid, there's good touching and bad touching and your privates are private and people don't don't have a right to go with what's private into what's private. Mm -hmm. And if people are standing too close to you and they're not friends or they're older people who are standing close, mm -hmm. real close, and it makes you uncomfortable or who touch you in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable, you need to tell someone until someone listens. And I promise I will always listen. Mm -hmm. And I remember when my daughter was really little, I guess she was about five. My son had a friend and she said, he comes in my room when there's no one else in my room and he stands so close to me, I feel uncomfortable. And so he wasn't allowed in our house again. Mm. But um, you can understand that. Some of the, some of the people in um, the chat are saying, that um, we can explain that they're, it's actually protected by law, their bodies are protected by law, and that it's not just your 
private. So your whole body is private. Um, That's which right. I think That's a wonderful. good point. And um, there's good touching and bad touching. Good touching is when you want to be hugged. Bad touching is when someone makes you uncomfortable and is getting too close in a way that that feels uncomfortable because predators go into a dissociated state when they abuse children. Oof. They don't want to face what they're doing. They don't want to admit it to themselves. You said earlier one of the, uh, the things that's that's problematic is that children are trained to obey. Um, that's how I was brought up. <laughs> It didn't work out <laughs> for them exactly because I still had the fight in me. But can we talk about like the parenting techniques? I have some in my pocket uh, that I use that that can maintain the dignity of the child while making sure they don't do say dangerous things. Um, for example, my daughter likes to climb on this thing called the learning tower that we have in our kitchen, which is uh, to allow her to get up to the uh, kitchen counter so that she can participate in the cooking activities and um you know we're italian and we stand around the counter talking and eating all the time it's cultural so she needs to be up there with us and um she tends to want to climb it and jump on it and do a handstand when really it's not made for that kind of thing so i've just said listen you have a choice i want you to make a smart choice uh, the choice is you just use the learning tower for standing and you can use the climbing and the playground for jumping or you can do handstands on the floor um but if you do use the learning tower for uh, for this kind of activity we're going to have to take it away because it's not safe for that kind of activity you can make the choice and um i feel like that's an empowering way to let her make a choice based on what it is but sometimes the old italian comes out of me sorry i don't mean to bash italians but i mean I, this is how I was raised. So I'm trying to make a different choice in my own parenting, which is like, get off that thing. You listen to your mother, you know, and ah, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I feel like it's better to give them a choice and let them have the autonomy to choose knowing that there's a consequence. Well, sometimes it's not safe to give them a choice. So sometimes you have to say, look, I am in charge of, of making sure you don't hurt yourself. If you use this standing device for other things, the likelihood is you'll hurt yourself. The weight is uneven and you can show her how it's uneven and you could fall down. And I need to protect you. Later on, maybe you'll be a, a fancy gymnast and you'll be able to balance on it on one hand, like I can't. <laughs> like I can't. Yeah. But right now, you cannot do that. It's too dangerous. Just mm -hmm. like you can't run in the street because you could be hit by a car. It's too dangerous. That's just sad, but it's true. Uh, Mr. One Not of our a jungle. Yeah, that's what I think too. I think all of this drive to like preserve, this is why I was, they never were like, let's preserve childhood. They're like, snakes will bite you. You know, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't, my family didn't do that. One of the, one of the, and I really appreciate you being here. I realize we've been, we're far over the time that you have uh, agreed to come on here. So, but I think we've really, we've, we've touched a wide range of topics. If there are other questions uh, from the, from the, from the chat, please put them in now and I will ask uh, as we wind it up. Um, yeah, one of the commenters said, I find it generally interesting, Juliana, that you were taught to obey as a child. Well, I was asked to obey. By pa <laughs> My parents raised me to question everything, especially them and their rules. As they said, I would be more likely to respect and follow a rule if I understood it and agreed with it. Rules would have an open dialogue surrounding them. Oh no, we had no open dialogue, but let me tell you, they tried to get me to obey, but they were not. My father was not a rule obeyer. He came from a place where the rules were completely stacked against him and his family. And so it was a lot of getting around the rules. Um, so, you know, do as I say, not as I do doesn't work. So mm -hmm. my mother was more of a rule follower. So I do have some, I just pick which rules to follow yeah, <laughs> based course. on what's in the best interest of myself and my society you know that's right but it's the unquestioning 
obedience that is a problem because it makes children understand in a way that's so damaging that there are lines of dominance and submission and their job is to submit, which goes on into their politics to submit to an authoritarian ruler, even if it doesn't make sense because their job is to obey. And, and so here we are. That's with right. An authoritarian ruler. That's right. And a lot of people who vicariously enjoy his destructiveness and his breaking the rules because they don't. Sad. Wow. I have, this is so, I feel like we could go on for hours and uh, <laughs> I, I would, I look forward to you coming back next time. Hopefully, maybe we can talk about the psychology that um, raises up strongmen like we have uh, here in the United States happening right before our eyes and is happening in Australia, which we've talked about, because I've always felt that um, in order to vote for someone like a Bernie Sanders, there's going to have to be a lot of undoing of the ego and undoing of sort of the toxic masculinity of uh, you, you don't share your resources, you fight, you get to the top and then whoever else doesn't matter. And, you know, all the other psychology that undergirds this. So maybe we could discuss that when you come back. What do you think? Yes, and we could discuss that they aren't strong. They're weak and frightened. Mm -hmm. And that they're hiding behind an imagined strength. Mm -hmm. Like Trump, who's big on the military, go get him, but got out on bone spurs that didn't keep him off the golf course. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello, <laughs> man. Yeah, really? Yeah. Oh, well, there's so much happening in our chat right now. I'm just going to read you a couple comments that are coming in. You can comment. And then I'm assuming you probably have to go. <laughs> I do appreciate you being here. And especially for so long, it's just wonderful. Um, and this will be up on YouTube and we'll send it to you and you can do with it what you, what you will. Um, El Cartman Mancolo, hopefully I'm... I'm not getting that right, but uh, says, I have a 20 year old daughter, I 21 year old daughter. I started with explaining to her why and when I will say no and reinforced it when she progressed and saw, saw, saw the consequences relating to that same love and protection when I held her. She later said that when I said no, it was a hug rather than a condemnation, but it meant when I said no had to be specific and explained actions versus consequence. Yes. Here's a question uh, from Lauren. How do you handle men in the family with whom you are suspicious, but nothing has actually happened? Basically, the creepy people in the child's life that you can't simply remove entirely. Good question. Oh. Oh my well, God. first of all, you, you make sure you talk about good and bad touching and good and bad proximity of these people to them. And you can say, you know, this guy gives me the creeps. Does he give you the creeps? You don't have to pretend that everybody's wonderful because they're family. Mm -hmm. Both my mother and my husband's mother were very mean ladies. Mm -hmm. And so we had to say to our children, these are very mean ladies and they'll say mean things to you because they're our parents. We don't want you to answer back just what you think because we want to get along with them, but you can tell me later. And so they did. I remember when my um, husband's mother gave my daughter a sewing machine and my son some kind of cap gun. And um, she, my daughter was experimenting with it to see what it could do. And my mother-in-law said to her, that's stupid. That's stupid. Not like that. And my daughter said, well, I'm not playing with you, Grandma. Mm. And she told me later that that really made her angry. Mm. And I said, of course it would. She's very mean, and I'm glad you didn't play with her. Mm. So she didn't insult her, but she made a boundary. Mm. And oh. that's what you have to learn, that these people are a little weird. Just because they're adults, we don't have to pretend that they aren't weird or difficult. Yeah. And I think they're weird too. So if anything happens, let me know. 
Uh, no question from Carpe Pax on the chat, but we just wanted to say we love and appreciate Harriet and Professor Wolf for all the knowledge and wisdom they bring to the world. Thank you very much. Um, a I think the final question uh, from a man, from Lord Fertus, uh, as a man raised in a way that made me feel constantly inadequate in my masculinity, I would like to ask if you have advice working towards accepting touch with which I'm very uncomfortable. Not sure if you saw it or asked if I, oh, okay. So we're asking now, here we are. And everyone, yeah. look at all these nice people are putting hearts in um, for your work. That's wonderful. The whole chat is lighting up with hearts and little cats that are clapping. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so the final well, question there. I think it's important to respect that you have trouble. And if you have somebody that you trust, whether it's a kid, because children often do listen and are respectful, or whether it's an adult that you're really close to, you can say, can you touch me really lightly because I, I get scared. I don't know why, but if you admit it and the other person can respect it, it means a lot. Touch often meant beatings or abuse in our past. And the reason it's uncomfortable is because it's related to something very uncomfortable. And so you need to respect that and ask the people who you trust to respect it as well. And move in closely and slowly on that issue on which you're vulnerable. We all have our vulnerabilities. There's no point in denying them or even though a lot of people do. But you have to know you're with someone safe who's not going to be mean to you because you don't need that. Harriet, what is coming up on the uh, podcast this week on Capitalism Hits Home? Well, what I thought I would do is talk about the uses and abuses of sex. Great. Because sex is that thing that is supposedly secret that, every, that is everywhere while being denied. And, you know, and most of the ads are involved in sex. If you go into the candy store, it's not like it was when I was a young kid. You walk through an aisle of breasts and vaginas. <laughs> of the porn and the candy bars are penis shaped. <laughs> so, you know, you have. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have this whole range of uses and abuses of sexuality that are oh. very frightening and you know there's few models because we don't have sex education like they do in France and most other European countries which is relationship education first it's about what happens to your body and then it's how you relate to other people which is a better way to teach sex education because it's relational not pornographic. Most American kids learn about sex through porn because in our puritanical culture, we're not allowed to teach reasonable sexual education. So oh my God, sad. we're so screwed up. We are. <laughs> thank you so much for being on this program. And well, thank you. Um, I enjoy talking to you and your listeners. It's we, really we will look out for the, for the new podcast and, um, yeah, we're going to have, okay. So we're already scheduled for two weeks from now, at the same I bat time, are, same bat channel. I think our presentation is out and oh. available on Epstein and the wider political picture of Epstein. Oh, great. I'll put the link to that in, in the chat so folks can get it. But um, you can, it's on Democracy at Work. Is that right? If you're watching somewhere yes, that's not it, here. It's on my website as well, harrietfraud.com. And you could probably get it in all sorts of places. What but, a great event that was. I really enjoyed it. So Yes, it was. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we'll see you next week, Dr. Harriet. Yeah. I'll be glad to be back. Or two weeks. Bye -bye. Okay, bye.